Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for attending our first event to kick off November, U.S. Payne's month-long educational campaign. My name is Nicole Hemingway, and I serve as the CEO for the U.S. Payne Foundation. Today, we are going to discuss the ins and outs of medical cannabis. Before we begin, I want to share our agenda. After going over some general items, I'm gonna talk a bit more about the month ahead and what to expect as we explore cannabinoids. Then I have the pleasure of introducing our amazing panelists before we close with a q and I just wanna go over a couple of housekeeping items with you. Please note that information provided today is for educational purposes only and may not be used as a substitute for advice from a healthcare professional. U.S. Pain does not recommend or endorse any one product, treatment, or modality. Additionally, the views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of any entities they represent or the U.S. Pain Foundation. Like I shared earlier, we will be taking questions. So please type in your questions using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. All of our webinars are recorded, so you will be able to find this at a later date and watch. Just keep checking our website for more information on where to find the recording. As I shared, today's discussion will focus on cannabinoids, specifically medical cannabis. And with that in mind, I want to reiterate what I shared earlier. This information is for educational purposes only and may not be used as a substitute for advice from a healthcare professional. Consult with a licensed physician before using any medical or recreational cannabinoid product. Please be advised that use and possession of certain cannabinoid products are prohibited under federal law medical cannabis and marijuana products, and recreational cannabis and marijuana products may be legal in some states, and although federal enforcement may not be applied consistently at the present time, this is always subject to change. The U.S. Pain Foundation would like to take a moment to thank our 2023 November sponsors, including our platinum sponsor, PureWell. We thank you all for supporting this very important initiative. So as we do every year in November, U.S. Pain Foundation develops a robust campaign that explores a specific pain-related topic. This year, we chose the theme, Know My Cannabinoid, Understanding Medical Cannabis, Understanding CBD. Our focus this November was to convey the importance of understanding cannabinoids, the different types and how they interact with the body, how they can be used to help manage pain, how to identify quality products, and how to better understand legality and access issues. We have planned activities throughout the month that include posting social media facts or statistics about medical cannabis and CBD, to really inform and empower you, publishing informative articles to our website, developing educational resource guides on understanding medical cannabis, CBD and hemp, and other cannabinoids, hosting two webinars, one of which is right now, that addresses key facts and issues pertaining to medical cannabis and CBD and hemp, and even holding a raffle giveaway. So this year, we are really excited to be holding a raffle giveaway for participation in our November initiative. To enter the drawing to win cool U.S. Pain swag, as well as the opportunity for a complimentary sample directly from one of our sponsors, individuals must register and attend one of our two educational webinars, reshare two social media Know My Cannabinoid facts, Reshare either a cannabinoid educational guide or a November article on social media. After completing all these participation requirements, one can fill out a form to enter the drawing. 
there will be 100 winners. All rules pertaining to the raffle, such as you must be 21 years or older, or only one per household, can be found in the form. The randomized drawing will take place on December 1st. So to find more information about the raffle, as well as our efforts this entire month, from signing up for future events, to reading our articles, or finding our educational guides, please visit our website, uspainfoundation.org. So today we are going to be discussing medical cannabis, and we are fortunate to be joined by some key leaders in this space. It truly is my distinct pleasure to introduce our guests. Sasha Kalchev Korn brings a wealth of experience in human rights, education, and communications to her role at Realm of Caring. Long interested in the intersection between cannabis legalization and human rights, both here and abroad, Sasha is passionate about connecting individuals to effective plant-based methodologies for medicine and care. In her current role as executive director, Sasha keeps Realm of Caring's internal teams, clients, and the community at large educated on industry developments and scientific advancements by producing webinars, writing blogs, and leading the day-to-day -day operations. Today, Sasha will discuss how medical cannabis interacts with the body and is used to help manage pain. Steph Shear is a founder and president of the Americans for Safe Access, a patient advocacy organization that since 2002 has served as a vehicle for medical cannabis and healthcare stakeholders to really engage in projects and programs that fill knowledge, policy, and regulatory gaps needed to integrate cannabis therapeutics into the U.S. healthcare infrastructure. Steph has trained over 100,000 individuals across the country on civic engagement, building a powerful grassroots movement for medical cannabis. Alongside two other organizations, Steph and ASA created the first medical cannabis standards in the areas of distribution, cultivation, analytics, manufacturing, packaging, and labeling. For over two decades, Steph's leadership has guided efforts with lawmakers across the country to adopt and improve medical cannabis legislation and bring the patient voice to Capitol Hill. Today, Steph will be speaking about product safety and regulation, as well as touching on the legality and access to medical cannabis in different states. Ellen Lennox Smith and Stu Smith co-direct medical cannabis advocacy at the U.S. Pain Foundation. Ellen lives with two rare conditions, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and sarcoidosis. Married to Stu for 50 years, he has been her care partner, and she has been his as he manages Parkinson's disease. Together, they raise awareness surrounding invisible pain and the impact medical cannabis can have on the lives of others. They speak with pain advocates about ways to effectively speak before lawmakers, medical students, and even healthcare professionals about medical cannabis and the need for all individuals to have access to it. In addition to being active in advocacy efforts aimed at protecting the rights of individuals using medical cannabis as medicine, they are also licensed caregiver growers for other people living with chronic pain in their home state of Rhode Island. Today, Ellen and Stu will discuss the direct impact medical cannabis has had on their lives, as well as how they got involved in advocacy efforts and the passion that advocating in, about access issues around medical cannabis has on their lives. So welcome each and every one of you. We are so happy and honored to have you here with us today. Um, with that, Sasha, I will turn it over to you. 
Okay, yes. So my name is Sasha Keltrup Corn, Executive Director at Realm of Caring Foundation, as Nicole stated. And so uh, so today we're going to be talking about medical marijuana and what that really is. So the cannabis sativa plant, it has more than 550 chemical compounds and over 100 identified phytocannabinoids. The two major cannabinoids of the cannabis plant are cannabidiol or CBD, and then the focus of my discussion today, which is delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol or THC, more commonly known. Despite many of the uh, discovered cannabinoids identified having potential medicinal benefits, when speaking about medicinal cannabis, one is most likely referring to cannabis varieties with high amounts of THC. So after understanding a little bit more about how THC interacts with our body, we'll take a closer look at the potential medicinal value based in available research, and then deepen our understanding of cannabis strains for identifying what may be of benefit to each of us individually. So THC, again, and this is referring to Delta 9 THC, was first discovered and isolated in 1964 as one of the two most abundant chemical compounds in the cannabis plant. THC is psychotropic in that it may have uh, intoxicating effects at certain amounts. However, when taken therapeutically, it also might have great benefit to our health and well-being. Over time, it was learned how THC interacts with different receptor sites throughout our body and brain, and eventually the endocannabinoid system was discovered as well as two cannabinoid receptor sites, which are CB1 and CB2, and then endogenous cannabinoids or endocannabinoids, which are created by our body to interact with the receptors. So the um, ECS, the endocannabinoid system, has been opened up really a new era for cannabinoid research, including evaluations on various therapeutic uses. Our, U our ECS is known as the largest neurotransmitter system in our bodies, and uh, selective uh, cannabinoid receptors have shown considerable efficiency in a variety of neuropathic pain uh, preclinical models while increasing amounts of evidence derived from clinical studies. And this has confirmed the potential of the ECS in providing benefits for patients with chronic pain and chronic inflammatory diseases. Preclinical studies have shown that cannabinoid receptor agonists block pain in various acute and chronic pain models and that inflammation is reduced. Interactions between the ECS and pain occur at several levels. Uh, just some of the ways it interacts includes neural system involvement of neuropathic and inflammatory pain, psychological interaction with the pain experience and the expression of cannabinoid receptors, enzymes, and ligands. Neural and non-neural cells in, in uh, injured tissues produce endocannabinoids as well. So these endocannabinoids modulate neural conduction of pain signals by mitigating sensitization and inflammation through the activation of cannabinoid receptors. CB1 receptors modulate neurotransmitter release in the brain and spinal cord and are also present in the nociceptive and non-nociceptive sensory neurons. Few CB2 receptors are located in the brain, spinal cord, and dorsal root ganglion, but they will increase in response to peripheral nerve damage. Endocannabinoids, uh, anandamide or AEA and 2-AG are those that are produced in those injured tissues through distinct biochemical pathways to suppress that sensitization and inflammation through activating the cannabinoid receptors. AEA mobilizes in response to inflammation and nerve injury and then modulates the nociceptive signals by activating our local receptors. 2-AG plays a prominent role in the descending modulation of pain during acute stress. So understanding this, this function of endocannabinoids, meaning, again, the, the, and the cannabinoids that our body are naturally producing, this helps us to explain the efficacy of exogenous cannabinoids, so the ones that come from plants, such as THC. THC interacts much in the same way that our endocannabinoids interact with our cannabinoid receptors. And the biologically hypothesized rationale for administering cannabinoids is whole body exposure to turn on pain inhibition. Uh, there are multiple uh, randomized clinical trials, um, and we'll talk a little bit about those uh, in a minute, that show cannabis as an effective pharmacotherapy for pain, and that data from clinical trials on synthetic and plant-derived cannabis-based medicines have suggested that they are a promising approach for the management of chronic neuropathic pain of different origins. It's also hypothesized that cannabis reduces the alterations in cognitive and autonomic processing that are present in chronic pain states.
So using um, THC for pain, cannabis for pain ha can be traced back a millennia. In 2900 BC, ancient Chinese texts show written records of cannabis as a medicine, recommending cannabis for constipation, rheumatic pain, female reproductive tract disorders, and malaria. It was also used in conjunction with wine as an anesthesia for patients during surgical procedures. The Chinese mostly use cannabis seeds containing very low levels of THC, and then from there, spread of uh, use of spread of varying preparations and potencies across and to India. However, it wasn't until the early 19th century that cannabis started to be explored in Western medicine. The research into the therapeutic potential of individual cannabinoids took place in the 1970s. In response to an ever-growing number of reports that cannabis THC specifically suppressed the signs of pain in various experimental models, a uh, leading a pharmaceutical company began to develop synthetic analogs of THC as potential analgesics. This research program was never completed, but it did generate an important set of novel cannabinoid receptor agonists that play a major discovery for the CB1 receptor. And then due to the interest in the anti-nausea and appetite stimulating properties of THC that were discovered along the way, synthetic forms known as dronabinol, marinol, and nabilone became licensed as medicines for suppressing nausea and vomiting produced by chemotherapy and then stimulating appetite for AIDS patients. And then a published study that compared the oral solution and capsule forms of dronabinol under fasting and fed conditions found that dronabinol exerted a modest but clinically relevant analgesic effect on central pain in the pain treatment of patients with multiple sclerosis. So although the proportion of patients that showed adverse reactions was higher in dronabinol treated than placebo treated patients, it did decrease over time with the drug's long-term use. So being that THC does have those psychotropic properties, as one may take higher doses, they might feel those intoxicating effects, but tolerance may build over time. And due to this accumulating research, Sativix, which is a THC CBD ratio product, is licensed for use in Canada as an adjunctive treatment for symptomatic relief of neuropathic pain in adults with multiple sclerosis. Uh, in terms of um, clinical pain, uh, there was a recent systemic review and meta-analysis of cannabinoids for medicinal use that examined 28 randomized trials among the 2,454 patients with chronic pain indicated, and that when compared, compared with a placebo, cannabinoids were associated with a greater reduction in pain and greater average reduction in numerical pain ratings. In this review, neuropathy was the most commonly cited source of that chronic pain. And then to go a little bit deeper into a couple of those studies, patients with cancer enrolled in Minnesota's medical cannabis program self-reported after four months of beginning medicinal cannabis that there was a significant reduction in the severity of symptoms across all eight measures, which included in the study, anxiety, lack of appetite, depression, disturbed sleep, fatigue, nausea, pain, and vomiting compared with their baseline. And then there's another study of a uh, total of 128 individuals over the age of 50 with chronic pain and sleep issues. They were recruited for a study in Israel and med medicinal cannabis was used, um, use was associated with less problems waking up at night compared with non-medical cannabis use, showing that medical cannabis use may have an overall positive effect on maintaining sleep throughout the night in chronic pain patients. So now to um, so talking about the research, it's a, almost impossible to talk about um, THC and be, because if we think about what's commercially available, it's a little bit impossible to talk about without talking a little bit about the botany of the plant because this helps us to make informed decisions when it comes to purchasing. Um, so choosing a THC product, it can be difficult because there's a, a vast number of administration methods as well as strains that are available. And so I want to talk a little bit about what is a strain. Um, so the cannabis A family includes about 12 genera and 170 species. And so the genus, it's a classification that's the below the family and above a species. Some conclude that the genus cannabis comprises a single species being cannabis sativa. And it's proposed by others that the cannabis genus consists of three species being cannabis sativa, cannabis indica, and cannabis ruderalis. Others will even include a fourth species in that, which is a, an, a hybrid between all three of the aforementioned. Um, sativa types are characterized by their tall and narrow leaves, widely believed to produce a stimulating cerebral psychoactive effect, and indica types are short with wide leaves and are reported to produce sedative relaxing effects. 
Ruderalis is thought to be a descendant of Indica, although it's just adjusted to the climate where it originates, resulting in a shorter and stockier plant. So despite the debate among the scientific committee, dispensaries and brands may still stick to those three classifications for THC products being Indica, Sativa, or Hybrid. Hybrid meaning a, a combination of the Sativa and the Indica, combining those two effects. Um, so this is technically only speaking to the genetic structure versus the effect of the plant. But once we start taking a deeper look at the chemical profile, then we get to understand the trait, the strain more, um, more clearly. So when talking about terpenes, um, there are an infinite number of strains out there. But if we want to look beyond the indica sativa hybrid classifications, and then look at the mixture of cannabinoids and terpenes, they give us more insight to what effect might be produced. So terpenes are compounds produced by plants such as fruits, trees, herbs, and a variety of other species that are responsible for determining their distinct scents. Uh, terpenes are so abundant in nature that they actually form the largest group of plant chemicals. Um, plants use terpenes as a defense mechanism. Uh, they release a strong odor and flavor. It's intended to ward off certain insects or herbivores, but they don't only play that role in protecting the plant, but research shows terpenes to have multiple health promoting properties in humans. They can enhance health benefits alone or synergistically with other terpenes and cannabinoids of the cannabis product. So do strains mean anything? Uh, when considering the biochemical components, strains matter. Understanding the quantifiable amounts of cannabinoids of your product is an important step in knowing the quality of your product. Differences in observed effects can be attributed to the terpene content versus the strain that it's associated with. For example, it might not be the strain labeled as an indica as to why someone feels sedated once they take it. That feeling might actually be attributed to myrcene, which is a terpene research to have sedative effects. Myrcene is also regarded as a potent pain reliever in that it reduces inflammation and relaxes muscles. Um, so it's equally important to recognize that a strain's effect on one person could trigger a different outcome for somebody else. Factors such as ailments, uh, genetic predispositions, tolerance level, setting, consumption method, and others are worth consideration in determining the product, um, the result that a product might have. So I know Steph will touch on this more, but I just didn't want to cover medicinal cannabis um, without recognizing that there are certain states where it's still not uh, allowed. Um, so we want to pay attention to the legality for a state to pay state to state, depending on where we live, um, and then how to obtain a medical cannabis card. So that will vary from state to state as well. And then in states where medical cannabis is not available, we might see offerings of additional THC analogs to include Delta-8 and Delta-10. And while, yes, these are, these are THC analogs and they may have medicinal benefits as well as intoxicating effects, these are synthetically derived uh, from hemp as it, they only occur naturally in very small quantities. So it does need to be synthetically and derived in order to extract it out. Um, so as with any cannabis product, it's important to ensure that a quality product, um, that a product is of quality. So that way you can trust it and to seek guidance when it comes to dosing. Um, but with synthetically derived products in particular, it's really stressed to do your due diligence as residual solvents may be produced as a result of the extraction process, a solvents of which we might not even be aware of just yet. So this is all to say the quality of your product matters. And so um, make sure you seek help before you, before you buy. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sasha, for all that information. Um, I, we are definitely getting in a lot of questions. Just so you know, we will be answering them at the end. So um, please, if you continue to have more questions, put them into the Q&A. Uh, and now I am going to turn it over to Steph. Thank you so much. And thank you for putting this on. There, I know this can be a lot of, a lot of information for people. Um, so I'm grateful for organizations like the U.S. Pain Foundation. I just want to say hi to all my fellow pain patients, uh, people living with pain. Um, I'm going to introduce yet another controversial medication to you that has stigma um, and is not always easy to find. So um, a lot of the work that we do is to try to remove that stigma and to move cannabis into a framework that makes it more accessible so that you're not having to learn street language and 
and identify, but we'll talk a little bit about that. So thank you, Nicole, for putting this on. Let me just get this. Did that work? It did, yes. Okay, fantastic. Just um, as you mentioned, uh, I'm with an organization called Americans for Safe Access. Um, we have been advocating for safe and legal access to cannabis therapeutics for uh, use in research uh, since 2002. Um, and when we talk about advocacy, what we're doing is we're we're working towards the creation of a world where patients only have to think about their medication um, in their um, uh, healthcare journey. So not when making basic life decisions. Uh, so as Sasha mentioned, you know, there's a patchwork of um, state laws. And so that impacts, you know, uh, for cannabis patients, uh, where they can live, where they can work. Um, and so we are advocating for a regulatory framework that invests in the development of standards cannabis products um, that ensures a safe and consistent supply that fosters doctors integrating cannabis into their patients' treatment as a frontline medication, um, encourages insurance coverage, and prohibits employment, housing, parental, and healthcare discrimination. I think there's a, a lot of people working on this issue, so it's always good to sort of set up the framework um, where we're coming from this. So when we talk about medical cannabis patients, you know, there's um, there's been a lot of different definitions over the years, um, but we're talking about you know people who are living with the condition. Um, are experiencing symptoms for which cannabis or cannabinoid-based therapeutics is either the only treatment, a more suitable option, um, or it works as an adjunct treatment, including side effect mitigation and other available care options. And so I want to start with sort of just like the basic framework. So um, as Nicole mentioned, cannabis is illegal at the federal level. Um, uh, however, we were able to pass an amendment uh, to the Department of Justice budget in, uh, actually the first time we passed it was in 2014, um, that actually prohibits the Department of Justice from enforcing those laws um, that Nicole mentioned. So it is still illegal federally, but the Department of Justice can't inform and uh, uh, can't actually um, enforce those laws. And then we also, um, in 2018, um, a amendment was added to the 2018 Farm Bill that actually descheduled uh, cannabis products that have less than 0.3% uh, THC, um, which is part of, I think, what um, Sasha was talking about, the sort of patchwork of these various products. Um, and then I think something that, that's really important that a lot of people overlooked was last year we passed the Medical Marijuana and Cannabinoid, um, sorry, Cannabidol Research Act, um, which you know, did a lot of things to sort of move barriers for research, uh, but it also uh, solidified a doctor's rights to talk about their talk about cannabis to their patients. Um, so before that was only protected under uh, First Amendment laws. Now that is, you know, sort of the law of the land. So doctors do not have to fear um, any retribution for talking to their patients about cannabis. And so then we have, so the markets are sort of available to people. We have these are CBD, hemp-derived cannabinoid markets, um, which are sort of popping up everywhere and are more pronounced in states that don't have medical cannabis or um, adult use programs. And then we have these state programs. So right now there's over 6 million registered patients in the United States. Um, and this long list, which I I just put up for effect. I didn't. You don't. You're not supposed to read these. Um, all of these. Um, these are the the various conditions that um, you know through the different states are are legally allowed for for doctors to write recommendations for cannabis. And so within these programs, I think you know something we're spending a lot of time on, and I know Sasha touched on, is really looking at the safety of cannabis. So. Cannabis um, has a, an amazing safety profile, um, but um, it's also susceptible to contaminants, just like any other agricultural product. Uh, but cannabis has some special things that we'll talk about in a second that actually make it even more susceptible. So whether you're um, purchasing from one of these state uh, programs, 
you're utilizing the gray or illicit markets or even cultivating yourself, um, you know, it's, it's good to be aware of what these contaminants are um, and what the symptoms are. Uh, so you're, you, you know what to do when you, when you, they're there. So, you know, some of these contaminants, um, you know, you find in basic foods, you find everywhere, E. coli, uh, salmonella, um, uh, mold, these are all pretty common for, um, uh, for agricultural products. And, you know, the top symptoms are sort of, you know, associated with, with this list of contaminants on the top. Um, so these are, you know, you should never um, get a fever from using cannabis. And so if you have a fever um, after using a product, that means that there's a, there's a contamination, there's something wrong with that. Cannabis does not cause seizures. Um, it does not cause diarrhea or sinus infection, sinus infection. So all of these are, are symptoms that there's something else going on. Um, but as Sasha had touched on, you know, some of these program, these, uh, um, sorry, these uh, uh, substances that are used for extractions um, are actually very dangerous. And if they're not, if these extractions are not done correctly, um, you know, if you have uh, butane or ethanol uh, left in these products, they're, they're quite dangerous. Um, and unfortunately, you know, you may not feel the effects right away. Um, and so the sort of the bottom list is sort of health conditions um, that can occur from, you know, ex extended exposure to these contaminants. Um, and so I think, you know, the best way for a patient to protect themselves is just to understand what, what actually are the common side effects of cannabis um, and how long those last. Um, and so if you have a, you know, if you're dizzy, for longer than three hours, then there is a is a problem, and you need to seek medical attention. Um, so again, you know, uneasiness and anxiety is a um, is a very common side effect, especially of THC, and it can make it actually kind of a challenge um, in in trying to determine you know how serious uh, your the side effect is or to make a plan. So um, you know, people every you know thousands of people every year. Uh, go to the emergency room thinking that they're dying um, when in fact they've just ingested too much THC. Uh, so again, you know, ahead of time, uh, before we use a cannabis product, um, or if you have a loved one that's going to try cannabis products, really, you know, take a minute to understand what these these side effects are. Have some water next to you. Uh, have some uh, some lemon juice that actually can help with THC. Um, uh, too much if there's too much THC in your system. Uh, but again, you know, it may not be clear to people what a side effect should look like. And especially with these new products like the THC Delta 8, um, these are synthetic products that actually we don't know what the what the long-term effects are. Um, there's never been a time on earth where humans have consumed this much um, uh, THC Delta 8 or some of these other new synthetic cannabinoids. Um, so again, you mentioned these can these can, uh, contaminations can happen anywhere along the supply chain. Um, and so because cannabis um, is special for so many reasons, but the plant itself, it's actually a bioaccumulator. So it can actually pull um, heavy metals and pesticides and things out of the soil that you didn't even know were there. So you need to be very careful when you're, if you're cultivating yourself, that you know what's in your soil, what's in your water. Um, it also um, is it grows in humid um, environments, which are which also other microbials love. Um, and you know the resin on the plant is sticky, so it it can actually pull in other contaminants from the air. Um, and so those are sort of just like human error, you know, agricultural um, contaminations. Um, and then we also have the issue of um, of having these. Uh, solvents stay through the through the manufacturing process, uh, but because cannabis is a, a high quality or high value crop, um, it's very susceptible to to uh, producers maybe using too much pesticides to try to save the crop. Um, we also have found in labs that um, additives are added to add weight. Um, a lot of times, you know, terpenes are are added to an end product because they've been removed during extraction. And so, you know, uh, food grade um, uh, 
uh, terpenes like limonene have not been tested for uh, inhalation. Uh, and I think, you know, a few years ago, you may remember the vape crisis where people were adding um, vitamin E and coconut oil into vaporizers that actually resulted in death. So not all of these um, side effects are going to be as uh, prominent as as what we saw with um, the vape crisis, but it's something that we need to be looking out for. So again, through the cultivation uh, uh, and sort of processing, this is where pesticides, molds, mildews, fungus, and yeast come in. Heavy metals I mentioned from um, from the soil, uh, bacteria, viruses, and then also foreign matter um, manufacturing. This is where we have the additives and um, alter adulterants um, and residual solvents. Um, and then storage. So this is sort of where where, where patients come in. Um, you know, when you bring cannabis home uh, from a store or from a caregiver, um, it's still susceptible to uh, molds, mildews. Um, and so you have to be very careful where you store it. Um, and then also, um, you know, the vape cartridges, you really need to, to throw those out um, after a period of time because uh, actually heavy metals leak into those products um, over over a period of time. So we have these different markets um, that, we, that we had mentioned. So there's there's um, uh, a handful of states that allow home cultivation. Um, and again, I mentioned, you know, you, you still have to be careful um, during the cultivation uh, process to make sure that you're not contaminating your own products. Then there is the CBD and hemp derived cannabinoid market, which is, um, you know, it is legal under the the hemp bill, um, but there's no regulatory agency. So these products are there's no one overseeing the regulation of these products. And then we have the gray and illicit market. There are you know stores popping up all over the country um, that are selling THC um, delta eight. Um, there's a in you know, markets like California um, and New York stores just open up and act like they're um, a state program. Um, and then you have the state programs, which, um, you know, ha all have some type of product safety uh, regulations, but they vary dramatically from state to state. Um, and as you can see here at the bottom, um, this is an example of sort of what states are testing for, for which items. Um, and you can see to the right, you know, um, the green states are actually the only states that have a recall program. So if there is a discovery of a, of a contamination in a product line, uh, a patient may not may not find out about it. Um, and I'm going to tell you about a lot of resources so you can do a deeper dive into, you know, the products that are available in your market. So product safety protocols are basically a part of every regulated um uh, market for you know that sells products for human consumption, and so for um, for cannabis products, you know this includes you know um, safety guidelines, uh, you know for how to handle cannabis safely, education and training, um, you know actually you know, levels that are allowed, um, you know of, of different contaminants, um, you know guidelines on how to store store it, what should be tested. Um, and you know, a track and trace that can follow that product through guidance for workers to safely work with cannabis. And those are usually you know uh, created by regulators that are overseeing that process. So from you know for cannabis regulations that goes from uh, you know uh, farming to manufacturing, processing to laboratories into the stores or or delivery. Um, and you know, if you have a question about whether your the product that you're buying is regulated, say, you know, every state that has a, a cannabis program, they have a list of uh, stores that are actually regulated. If you're buying online, um, you know, there are delivery services that are regulated under these state laws um, and they would be listed on that. But I, I think also if, if you're on a site that is allowing you to, um, you're saying that they can deliver a cannabis product to you anywhere in the United States, that the product is probably not regulated. And so the, the whole point of these regulations is to make sure that, you know, consumers have confidence in what's on the labels and that they are free of contamination. Um, and so this also includes a, you know, uh, a track and trace program from seed to sell to make sure that every step of the way of these products, um, you know, that, that 
that someone's looking out for consumers and making sure that these products are safe for human consumption. And so, you know, within these sort of gray markets, you'll see products that look very professional, right? They, they, you see them at gas stations. They've got nice little labels on them. They look like, um, you know, and I think in, in the U.S., we have grown accustomed to having, you know, product safety protocols that, that oversee anything that we purchase. But if there is a label um, on a product that either says that it's contaminant free um, or it's saying what the level of cannabinoids or terpenes are, the only way that someone can can get those numbers and, and that data is if it's gone through laboratory testing, right? And so um, when someone takes a product to a laboratory for testing, they'll receive what's called a certificate of analysis. And so if you see a label on a product, you should be able to ask the manufacturer um, of that product to see the certificate of analysis. And so, you know, uh, cannabis labels can, you know, they look different from state to state and, you know, sometimes they're, they're more focused on marketing, um, but every label should have a batch and lot number. It should have the license number um, of, if it's a regulated um, uh, company or a in a regulated uh, market. Um, it should have the cannabinoid and terpene contents. It should have an, ex uh, an expiration date um, or at least a production date. It'll have other warning statements, um, and then it'll, it should tell you, um, you know, what it was tested for. If it's, you know, if it passed the microbial tests, um, the certificate of analysis um, should have information about the laboratory. So you want to make sure it, it's, it's a real laboratory. There's uh, usually signatures from people who work at the laboratory. Um, it'll tell you, you know, what the accreditation is for that laboratory, um, and it'll tell you the the date of the test. Um, but you know, in order to verify that what is on a label is really what is in that project, the only way that you can know that is to ask for the certificate of analysis. Um, and then when you see that certificate of analysis, you wanna make sure that the batch number is the same um, and that the contents are the same, right? And there's, a, there's obviously a lot of other information. But again, if, if, if um, a product manufacturer will not show you a certificate of analysis, it's kind of weird, right? Like, so if you you either did the test or you didn't, um, and you know, I think that we're trying to get consumers uh, in the habit of always asking for the certificate of analysis, um, and then you know, using your dollars to make sure that you're you're only you know purchasing products that can uh, prove uh, that they that they have been tested. If you're purchasing CBD products online, um, they may have the the certificate of analysis on the website. Um, and just, again, make sure that the batch um, number matches the certificate of analysis. So, you know, there's there's other issues with labeling besides just uh, contaminants. Um, you know, if they're, if they're mislabeled as far as the THC levels um, or, you know, they, they're mislabeled as far as, you know, not having other cannabinoids, um, you know, this can, you can have a... Um, a, a severe reaction where you're not expecting um, to have so much THC. So the short term, um, you could have a rapid heartbeat, you could have a drop in blood pressure, you could just be uncomfortable, you can get nauseous. Um, you know, for health treatments, you know, if, if you're not getting the the right cannabinoid profile, you know, you can have a return of system uh, of symptoms. Um, you can actually backslide in your treatment. And it's also just really frustrate frustrating. Um, uh, you know, also getting the wrong cannabinoid profile can mean, you know, that maybe you can't go to school or work, um, or maybe, maybe you can't carry out some of your family responsibilities because you're intoxicated, or maybe because, you know, you, you're not able to manage your pain. Um, and then there's can be some, some other real, um, issues around, you know, if you're, if you're trying to use just CBD products and there actually is THC in them, uh, and you fail a drug test, you can lose your job. Um, you know, we hear from patients often how frustrating it is that they, they have to buy, you know, a bunch of different products to try to, to see what's going to work for them. Um, and, you know, if it's not labeled correctly, it means they've, they've wasted the money, they can't really return it. Um, and then, of course, because of the, the delayed onset of, um, of cannabis, um, you know, you may um, not really you know, already be driving somewhere and, um, and the, the product kicks in. 
Um, and so, you know, a part of the, a lot of this has to do with regulations. Um, I think one of the most common things we hear as far as people taking too much THC on accident um, is that they buy a product that has several dosage um, and uh, you know the state doesn't require um, homogeneity testing, which means that they're testing that every dose has the, you know, the every dose of the product is the same. Um, and so, you know, you may get a candy bar that says it has 200 milligrams of THC and it has little, you know, break off points that tells you, you know, that means that, you know, there's going to be 10 uh, milligrams in each sort of smaller dose. Um, and it could be that one of the servings has 180 <laughs> milligrams um, and the rest are spread out. So, you know, these are, these are sort of challenging um, items that I just want, we definitely want people to be aware of, um, but also, you know, the regulations of these, um, uh, of these products is still unfolding at the state and federal level. Um, we also see in a lot of states that, um, that actually companies shop their products around um, to find um, product, you know, places that will give them a higher THC level, um, or maybe that, you know, will give them a pass on microbial or other contamination. So there's a, a lot happening right now um, around cannabis. I just want to um, leave you with is that right now, um, uh, HHS um, and DEA uh, are actually looking at into the scheduling of cannabis. Um, HHS in August, actually, we found out that they made the recommendation to DEA that cannabis move from a schedule one to schedule uh, three. Um, and we're basically just waiting to hear um, what the the DEA and Department of Justice, uh, how they're going to respond. That could happen any day. Um, and what will happen is the DEA will put their recommendation um, up for the public on the federal register. Um, people will have a, a period of time to comment. And then the Department of Justice will make their, their final call. Um, the scheduling, uh, the change in schedule for cannabis doesn't mean a lot as far as sort of the the day to day, um, but it could have you know several long term impacts. And just as Heather had mentioned, you know there right now there are federal laws around cannabis that aren't being enforced. Um, and I think something that we're looking at is that um, you know right now um, because cannabis is a Schedule One substance, it's really only regulated by the DEA, right? Because it's prohibited. But as soon as cannabis um, moves out of Schedule One, it's actually going to be subject to um, to several other um, federal regulations. Um, and so, you know, there's sort of this big question of what what that's going to look like, because what we found out from the hemp um, the hemp authorization was that when cannabis was descheduled um, for these hemp products, the expectation was that FDA was going to regulate them. Uh, and actually FDA uh, basically said, you know, we can't regulate these products. We can only, um, you know, focus on, you know, what on what's on their labels, but we don't have the authority under the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act or under the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act. Um, so if you want more information about this, we have a ton, ton of info um, about this, the scheduling process um, and what it means. This is actually a, a fact sheet for what happened in 2016. Um, and like I said, you know, there's a there's a lot of unknowns, right? The we don't know um, what the final finding is going to be. We don't know how that's going to be enforced. Um, a lot of the enforcement is going to be sort of up to um, the executive branch, which you know, right now that could be good, but we don't know what the you know what that could be over years. Um, and you know, uh, we're also starting to see a lot more activity at HHS and NIH. Um, uh, actually, uh, in December, we should be seeing a report from them um, that was required under um, the Medical Marijuana Cannabinoid Research Expansion Act. Um, it's a report that to the health committees um, about you know, how to approach research uh, and expanding access. Um, and I, as I mentioned before, as I was flooding information at you about um, state um, uh, protocols, uh, we actually put out a report every year, uh, state of the states report where we grade the states, but and sort of what 
um, what's allowed in your states, what the relations are, what to expect, and how to engage to improve those laws. Uh, we also um, issued a report this year called Regulating Patient Health. Um, we did a deep dive into what states are testing for, what those gaps are, um, and we'll actually be next week, we're going to be releasing a um, patient's guide to product safety um, that's going to have a lot of the information I was just um, going over about, you know, how to how to safely um, navigate the regulatory or unregulated markets. Um, and so, you know, one thing you do is educate yourself, make sure you you know as much as possible. And as a as a cannabis consumer, you're um, you know making choices with as much available, knowing. Oh, Steph, I think that you're cutting out right now. Um, you can uh, shop from regular. I'm sorry, can is that better? Yes, we can hear you now. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. Uh, I think my computer is tired of listening to me. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just, uh, and I'm almost done. Um, so, you know, we, we, if you can shop around, you know, um, each state will have a list of um, um, the report that we're putting out next week. We'll actually have some guides for you to, to quickly look those up. Um, if you're purchasing online, again, uh, remember to ask for the certificate of analysis. Um, we have a, a more in-depth look at what what's in those certificate of analysis and what, um, you know, what you need for. Oh, you're, you're cutting out again. Um... Um, you're not. Oh, Steph, so... I'm, I will just end then. Okay. Can you still hear me? Uh, it comes in and out, um, but maybe. It's okay. Um, okay. Thank you so it's much. Okay. Right. This was such amazing. I'll be um, Thank you for giving us all so much to think about. Again, there's a lot of questions we are going to try to get to as many as we possibly can. Um, but Right now, I'm going to turn the stage over really quickly to Ellen and Stu to kind of share their lived experiences uh, utilizing uh, cannabis as a medicine to help with, with Ellen's health and then what medical cannabis has actually done for their lives and, and the advocacy work that they are now doing to help others uh, also have access um, to it. So thank you again, um, Sasha and Steph, we will bring you guys back on, but I'm going to turn it over right now to Ellen and Stu. Hi, uh, if you will bear with me, you've now heard from the experts. Now you will hear from me about the real world of cannabis. Um, I would like to talk about the impact cannabis had on my life and how we, Ellen and I were introduced to it. And, the, and once again, the impact it's had on our life. I, you have to bear with me. I have Parkinson's disease. I wrote out some notes because sometimes I don't have confidence in my ability to think coherently. So I'm going to have to, have to read this. Cannabis has had a direct and long-standing impact on my life. I can honestly say that just as the chance meeting with my wife some 50 years ago would shape the trajectory and quality of my life, cannabis would have a similar impact. My involvement with medical cannabis began with my wife's medical diagnosis two decades ago. Ellen was diagnosed with a severe connective tissue disorder which produces severe chronic pain. Unfortunately, Ellen possessed a rather unique body chemistry. As a result, she was unable to metabolize any of the over-the-counter medications for pain relief. This, this problem resulted in her pain doctor experiencing extreme frustration and trying to seek a, a help, a help for her. He suggested that she turn to cannabis. Cannabis is legal in Rhode Island. Ellen would begin utilizing cannabis, cannabis in 2007, while cannabis did not eliminate all of Ellen's pain, it did effectively reduce her pain to a manageable level. Perhaps more critically in my mind was the beneficial impact medical cannabis had on her sleep cycle. Pain, pain is, is part of the chronic pain syndrome. And Ellen had gone years experiencing little health healthy restorative sleep. Based upon my interactions with Ellen and any number of patients over the years, I have, I have come to the conclusion that pain deprivation, sleep deprivation, healthy sleep deprivation is so impactful on chronic pain that it must be dealt with if you are to get effective treatment. Under Rhode Island state law, medical cannabis patients can 
legally grow their own medication. Ellen and I continued, went ahead and built a grow room in our cellar, where we grew enough medication for her, for myself, and for five other patients. I explored, um, I, ca I cannot imagine life without this amazing plant-based medication. Prior to Ellen and I utilizing this medication, our future appeared rather, rather dim. Cannabis has injected hope and a sense of renewal into our lives. I was uh, diagnosed with, with Parkinson's disease about three years ago, and I have suffered from chronic back pain. About 10 years ago, I started utilizing cannabis, and it seems definitely to have assisted with my back pain. And as far as Parkinson's disease, I spoke with my Parkinson's doctor, and he had no problems with me using it. And I think there needs to be more research done. But I can say that um, what I have read, which is actually little, but I've seen studies that say that it helps with tremors. I have no tremors. Whether this is my Parkinson's medication or my DEX exercise regimen, I don't know. But I can say this, my life would be totally different without, without cannabis. Thank you. Hi, and I'm the other half. Let me just take a seat here. I'm Ellen Lennox Smith, and I am the reason we initially got involved with the um, use of met, uh, cannabis. As my husband mentioned, I went 54 years not understanding what was really wrong with me. The pain became so difficult, but yet I also was finding whatever I was trying to help with relieving the pain. Nothing was helping and I kept feeling like I was having reactions. I was finally sent to a pain doctor before one of my surgeries that I was flying out to Wisconsin for. And um, he was the one that had suggested trying cannabis. And to be honest with you, I literally sat there and laughed at him thinking, sure, I wanna spend the rest of my life feeling high because my only experience with cannabis, I'm a total wuss, was in college. I tried it one time, smoked a joint and spent the entire afternoon laying in bed, feeling like I was going in and out of sodium pentothal. But I thought, why would I want to live that type of life? Well, I learned very rapidly when I took the advice and went home and um, did start to use cannabis that when you have a body in pain, the reaction is totally different. I was able to get pain relief and health. So I did listen to him, uh, even though I was scared, I went home and found out when I called the pulmonologist with the sarcoidosis that smoking would be fatal, that the only way I could take it was to consider ingesting. So that evening, uh, despite my um, hesitation, I converted cannabis from some directions to some friends to a, an oil form, took a teaspoon of it that night, not having a clue what I was doing, scared to death, warned my husband I had taken it, thinking I was gonna be a wreck, and was absolutely shocked when I woke up the next morning having slept the entire night. I was absolutely thrilled and that began a new journey for my husband and I in terms of how could we keep our mouth quiet about this. This was magical and um, eventually had DNA drug sensitivity testing to show that my life was real. I couldn't even metabolize aspirin, Tylenol, ibuprofen, any of the opiates and here all of a sudden cannabis of all things became my answer. So we became very quickly um, advocates um, to try to help other people to get over the stigma that we were brought up to believe in that this was wrong and we were bad people for using it. And I thought, this is nuts. This is probably the safest thing that I ever used in my life and it was keeping me alive. Um, my husband and I are both in our 70s now. We've been home growing since 2007, thanks to the rights in here in Rhode Island. We have worked very hard um, and I have to say, Stephanie, thank you and America for Safe Access for all the guidance you've given us through the years. We've been able to get rid of the cost of, through advocating the cost of a medical card or caregiver card. Um, we still have work to do, but we have come a long way. And um, what I'm finding with cannabis is, yes, I have two incurable conditions. They, um, the particular Ehlers-Danlos creates pain in the joints and subluxations and dislocations, but I'm able to live with it. I'm able to have a quality of life because I get sleep at night. And uh, after all my surgeries of corrections that were needed, I don't take any pain medication at all, all day long. All I take is the oil at night. It allows me to sleep. And then I find that the oil actually keeps my body calm into the next day. So it's, it's, continues at, even at the age of 73 now to be magic for me. And I feel very fortunate about this. Um, I have 
issues that we're not going to stop advocating until my last breath. For instance, when I go to a hospital and I honestly can't take an opiate or any other medication that would normally be given, I'm not allowed to use it in a hospital. So that's one of the many reasons I continue to advocate. Um, I, I don't like the idea that my condition, somebody else living in another state, doesn't have the right to use it yet. That doesn't make any sense. So we want equal access for everybody across the country. We want affordability. Um, we shouldn't have to wait for, we should have, go back to the doctor patient relationship where if a doctor thinks this might be beneficial, that should be the end of the discussion. You know, you should have the right to go use it. So there's work to be done. We shouldn't be taxed for it. If you don't, those of you that go to a pharmacy, you don't have to pay for a card to walk into the pharmacy to get your medication. But yet many people in many states, um, as I said, we just got rid of this in our, our uh, most recent law. Many people still have to pay for a medical card on top of paying for medication that's not being reimbursed. So that's a big fix we need to. Um, the other thing I want to say, if you're lucky like we are in Rhode Island, you have the rights to grow. You will find a home grow is a very peaceful, um, very productive thing to do. It it's, um, really helps you with your medical condition to walk down into that, that garden and to see the growth and to know what it's going to do for you. And, and potentially you'll have an opportunity like we do to also share and help with other people. Um, and um, I just want to say that stigma is out there. We're, we've worked really hard to get rid of it. We've, you know, please help stand up with us and, and share your voice and share your experience like we do of the difference it's made in the quality of your life and to not be afraid of this, but instead see the value in this amazing plant that is turning our life around. And I know I'm still here today because of the use of cannabis and I can't tell you how grateful I am. So I know we're short on time, so I'm going to stop there and let Nicole have an opportunity for questions. Thank you. Well, thank you again, Alan and Stu. It, it's um, it's always, always so important to hear that lived experience and, and the impact uh, that it has had on your lives, not only your health, but also your purpose and your mission. And so um, I just want to say thank you for having the candor uh, to, to share what medical cannabis has done for you. Um, but also being that um, that light for so many others and that resource for others to to help them get involved in efforts and advocacy to make sure that people have access to safe quality products. Um, so thank you so much. And then uh, to Steph and to Sasha, uh, thank you for all this information. I am overwhelmed with how many questions that we have received. I do want to say that uh, Sasha has already shared some resources internally with us, so we will be following up with some people, giving them um, some other links and areas that they can go to find more information. Uh, today, we are focused on THC and medical cannabis. So I do know that there have been some questions in here that are also looking at CBD. Please know that next week on Thursday at at the same exact time, 1 to 2.30, we are going to be talking about CBD. So if those questions are not answered today, please tune in next week or watch the recording of our um, getting to know CBD and you next week so that you can get some of those addressed. So with that, I think I'm going to start with the first one and I'm going to um, ask Sasha, what strains and terpenes are showing promise for pain treatments? There's a lot of anti-inflammatory and that's usually where it starts with when, when researchers are looking into analgesic effects, usually they start with what is, uh, you know, known to be an anti-inflammatory and so THC being one, but then when we're talking terpenes, myrcene, linalool, beta carophylline, those are all BCP. Those are, those are three of my top choices I would go to for, um, anti-inflammatory and potential pain reduction. And then also, a little bit of sedation involved in those. So, you know, they can help you to relax or mitigate the pain throughout the night so you can sleep. Great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, this question, um, I'm gonna address it to Steph, but can I safely use expired THC products? Is that safe and will it still be effective? So um, cannabinoids actually degrade over they actually, and they, they also can change into other compounds. 
Um, and a lot of the shelf life um, testing is basically those numbers have come out of a legislator's aides office. They're actually not very scientific. So you know, one of the challenges that we're seeing, you know, with cannabis sort of staying outside of the healthcare infrastructure is, is that there haven't been the sort of basic knowledge, like, you know, that pharmacies would need to carry cannabis, like what is the shelf life? So as far as the safety goes, I would say um, a lot of it depends on the product. If it's, if it's, um, if it has other things that could expire, uh, remember edible um, have a lot of other ingredients that you shouldn't uh, consume after a period of time. Um, uh, so I would just say, yeah, be careful. And if it's in a, a vape cartridge, um, you know, I would, I would throw that out after six months to a year because, um, it, you know, we, we are seeing heavy metals coming into those, um, into those products. Great. Thank you. Um, S Sasha, Another question is my problem as a pain patient and now a retired psychologist is that research findings are not translated into actions that one can take to the local dispensary. Um, and I don't know, are there any ways to address this? And I'm going to start with Sasha and then I'll open the floor up if Steph has any um, insight and then Ellen and Stu as well. Yes. Yeah, so it's very difficult when you go to a dispensary because a lot of, I mean, the, essentially the bud tender is not allowed to talk about medical conditions with you or offer you medical advice. Um, so, so they are really restricted on what they can say and then the education that they receive. So a lot of dispensaries are learning from this and they're hiring a, phar a pharmacist, for example, to be on the floor during the hours that they're open. So that way they can offer that advice. Um, there are free resources online as far as education and tools that you can bring to your doctor to discuss it there. There are also medical cannabis friendly doctors that you can turn to for additional advice. A lot of the time though, unfortunately, that is an extra charge that insurance doesn't cover. Um, but there are other options out there. And yes, I would say, um, look for those resources maybe that <laughs> Nicole will send out uh, to the group after the call and, and there might be some in there for you. Yeah, I would just add to that that's, that's a, say that you know this is a this is a major challenge, right? Is that there's not a standardization and terminology. Um, the you know what um, the reporting and research as far as what's in the product, is not to what the products that are on the market, um, and or even how they're talking about the cannabinoids in those products. Um, and so, you know, um, I think that is if you really focus on safety first, make sure that the products are free of contaminants, um, that you have that certificate of analysis that shows that the cannabinoids that you're looking for, terpenes that you're looking for are actually in that product, that that's a starting place, right? And I think that, you know, um, as you guys know, as the U.S. Pain Foundation, pain is a big word, right? So, uh, and cannabis isn't helpful with all pain. Um, so uh, cannabis is has been found to be um, quite remarkable with neuropathic pain, um, where you may know that there's there's not many other medications that can treat neuropathic pain. And for that, you know, CBD, THC ratio, um, you just decide, you know, what, what you want to see in that. Um, but for acute pain, like post-surgical, you really hyper aware of your pain. Um, but uh, cannabis and opioids actually work really well together. They actually bond and allow you to use less of the opioid. Uh, cannabis is stored in your fat. Um, and so when you use opioids with cannabis, they actually bond and actually release over time. Um, and then so for chronic pain, again, it's part of that THC, CBD will help. It's more of just how you can manage that in your life. Thank you. One other question, and we've had a, a few of them, is that individuals cannot necessarily find a doctor that knows how cannabis is going to react um, to different medications that they might be taking. And is are there areas or places, resources that they could go to to get more help around this? Do they need to see a, a pharmacologist? Um, any other insight would be great. I do have a pretty good research article to share with you, Nicole, um, that kind of goes through the, the medications and the cannabinoids that interact because it does interact with our CYP450 
um, cytochrome P450 system. That's how it's metabolized a lot of our cannabinoids. And then a lot of our medications are also metabolized by this same enzyme system. So you could have a competition for metabolism where the medication or the cannabis isn't working as well as you'd like to. Um, you could also have it where the, the cannabinoid you're taking might actually increase the amount of medication that's available in the bloodstream. So with that, then you would experience adverse side effects as well of the medication. Um, so I do have an exhaustive list um, for those metabolizing enzymes in a research article that I could provide to you. And a lot of the time, it's just that our doctors are not, there's, there's not a course on endocannabinoid system. Our cannabis nursing degrees were only just approved in the, the last couple of months. So this is very new to the medical community. And I, it's, it's surprising um, to a lot of us that, you know, we, we talk to our doctors and they just don't know enough about it, but that's where just us as patients, we just have to be really informed and do a little bit of our own research and sometimes bring that information to our doctor and try to have an open conversation. Because especially if you are on medications, it is really important to have those open conversations with your doctor, um, just so that way you can both keep an eye on any interactions on any titration that needs to take place, whether lessening or increasing, um, and then any also like liver enzyme tests, blood serum draws um, are important to do too. If you are on a, a, a lot of polypharmacy and uh, you wanna incorporate cannabis into your, into your regimen. And I just also add that when you have that conversation with the doctor, one thing we have found really important is if you're going to try to decrease medications, for instance, I was on gabapentin. Um, it's, I think it's very important that you only attempt to undo one medication at a time. There's people that just jump in and try mm -hmm. to go off of everything at the same time. Your body's not ready to handle that. So if you're going to do it, you know, uh, talk to your doctor and also discuss which one you're going to start with first and undo one at a time and make yeah, sure that's that really, that's understanding really what the reaction is correct to that one drug. Okay. Yeah, that's very helpful. Ellen. I would just add to that. Also make sure that you have a supply um, of cannabis before you start removing other, <laughs> um, drugs from your system, because it, it can be, you can find a product that works and then go back to a dispensary and they've stopped making it. So you have to really think about your supply. Um, and I would say, um, I could also share some, some resources for you guys as well with, with those lists. But I think the, the one that concerns me the most is actually cannabis is a blood thinner. Um, and so you're, when you go into for surgery, um, your anesthesiologist will not ask you if you're on cannabis, if you're using me medical cannabis. It's not it's not on their radar, um, but it can, um, as Sasha mentioned, if you're already on a blood thinner, it can increase the effectiveness of blood thinners. Um, uh, but, you know, um, before you're going into surgery, you need to make sure it's not in your system um, or at least let the surgeon know um, that you are on a blood thinner. <laughs> That is such great advice. And again, I think this is just coming back to um, make sure before you do anything that you are consulting with your providers, that they know what you are, um, the different things that you are, are doing to manage your pain. A question that came up a few times too was around medical marijuana or medical cannabis cards and the expense uh, that is associated with them. And a lot of times the products are two or three times more costly than they are either in other states, depending on where you live and, or just being able to get access to medical cannabis products. Uh, do you know, are there any resources available to help those individuals um, that might have strict financial budgets, uh, but want to make sure that they're protected under the medical cannabis rights, but then also now are dealing with a uh, higher cost because of the recreational aspect coming into play. And I'm going to say there's, there's actually yeah. not, I mean, I wish there were um, better resources. I think this is where, you know, Ellen is a perfect example of, of where advocacy comes in. Um, and, you know, honestly, I think uh, we've, we've sort of gone as far as we can go with the state experiment. Um, you know, we first, you know, the reason we wrote the distribution laws and passed them in 2002 when we first started was actually just supposed to be triage to get patients off the battlefield of the war on drugs um, and where they could you know, find a place to safely um, access cannabis while we changed federal laws. And so you know, we've actually, you know, the last few years, we've, we've moved some mountains, major mountains. We rescheduled cannabis at the UN level. 
Um, we it looks like cannabis is about to be rescheduled in the U.S. Um, but this is where we need um, people to step up and and show their advocacy even more than ever. Um, and I think people feel like it's already over, it's done. Um, but if we if we don't continue, there is a, a real risk that cannabis is going to either end up in um, in the intoxicants markets or in the dietary supplement markets, which means that they will never be covered by insurance. Um, doctors won't be educated about them and they will exist on the periphery of the U.S. Um, healthcare system. So you know, this is a, a key moment to get involved and to um, help guide your federal policymakers into creating a pathway for cannabis to enter into the U.S. healthcare systems. And I add to that also that um, you will find within various states that some dispensaries do have programs available. Um, and you know, privately approach somebody, tell them your financial circumstance, and ask them if they have any program that would help reduce the cost for you. Some I know here in Rhode Island we do have that. Um, also, if you can find a caregiver, if that's allowed within your state, um, we have many times literally handed medication to patients that just can't afford it. Uh, and you'll find caregivers have a heart and will want to help you or bring the price way down. Um, so those are things to think about. That and also one <laughs> on one thing I can say about uh, full recre uh, recreation coming into our state is they kind of made a little bit of mistake and ended up allowing everybody to grow. And you can grow plants outside. If you could grow a plant outside for yourself, you could get enough medication probably for your year. Um, so that would be another way to bring the cost down. But you know, talk to somebody who has done that outside or grown inside get recommendations and information to understand what you're doing, but that all those items could help to bring the cost down. But it is a serious problem, as Steph said, which is, you know, we're not gonna give up this battle to make this affordable for everybody. Thanks. Some good information. Um, Sasha, a, a few people had asked, when you were talking about the strains and the terpenes you mentioned, could you repeat them a little bit one more time? And then are they more prominent in indica versus sativa? Uh, so it does depend too on just um, it being a monoterpene versus a sesquiterpene. So monoterpenes are very light and they'll evaporate pretty quickly once the plant medium is cut. So linalool is one of those that I mentioned, which is related to lavender. And so that's one that might evaporate quickly. What you might find with cannabis brands a lot of the time is that they might, uh, during the extraction process or the bottling process, put those terpenes back in so that way they can achieve that desired effect if it's not flour, of course, or if it's a gummy. So they might be putting other supplements. So that's also something to be aware of that a lot of companies are doing now that might provide added benefit and work synergistically with the cannabinoids to provide that desired response. Uh, or outcome. And so linalool, myrcene, myrcene is also found in hops, basil leaves, um, and then BCP. So that's also a uh, beta carophylline. So that's also found in black pepper. So even when uh, Steph was talking about, you know, what to do if you have too much and having lemon and water nearby, you could also make a lemon pepper water because BCP can negate some of the um, head high, the intoxicating effects of, of THC. Thank you. So I know we're getting close on time. I'm, uh, the questions keep coming in. Thank you so much. I'm going to try to get to at least five more. Um, one is I am a certified health and wellness coach. What can I do to both support my clients in their pain management, but also engage the state legislature regarding medical cannabis? The second part was that, is there any trainings or certifications available in regard to medical cannabis dispensing? Um, so we actually have a program called Patient Focus Certification um, that is basically trains um, people working in any part of the um, cannabis supply chain on how to um, produce um, cannabis safely, uh, free of contaminants, um, and then also guides for um, people working in um, dispensaries of actually engaging with patients. Um, I think it's, you know, it's a challenge to... Um, um, to really depend on on people working within the dispensaries, unless they're they are a pharmacist or a um, a healthcare practitioner to help guide um, those choices. Um, but as far as your state 
legislature is involved. Um, we have a ton of resources on our website that um, that you can plug right into to start reaching out and, and tons of material to bring to the to your um, representatives. And as Stephanie taught me a long, long time ago in Stu, your voice and your story makes a huge difference. Please go out and use your voice because people do listen and they remember your story. It's very powerful. Thanks, Ellen. Thank you. One person um, was looking at some of the products that they had and saw that their label does not have a label of contents, expiration date, or any of the things that were mentioned today. Um, do you think those are a product then that they should can reconsider taking? Or is there another place that maybe that information might be found that they should go and look maybe at the company's website? It depends on the country too, because some countries won't have the same regulations that we do when it comes to these products as well. And so a lot of times it's just finding the get, getting directly to the source. So getting to that company and requesting, just like Steph mentioned, the COAs and the information about it. I know you were going to say something, Steph, but I do want to say that we see that a lot worldwide, that that it does change uh, country to country. Yeah, I think, yeah, there's some, there's some basics that are on every product for human consumption um, that like expiration dates, those items. Um, it might have been in the packaging. Maybe you took it out of the packaging and there was something on the, the packaging that didn't have that. And so I would say, you know, um, I, I think what I'm trying to do as far as educating about product safety is that, you know, if, if that information isn't on there and you're not feeling side effects, then you know, right? Then you, the, the, at least you, you're, you're using that product saying, I don't know if there are contaminants in this product. I think what's really dangerous is you have like, a, like in Maine, for instance, there are product safety protocols that are part of the regulations that are just for adult use. And actually the medical cannabis program does not include requirements for testing for contaminants. And so the um, there was a poll done of patients in Maine and 65% of them thought that their products were being tested. So I, so I think a lot of this is really, you know, knowing that we're, um, I don't want us to always have to stay in this space. Like I mentioned, a lot of our goal is to get to the point where you really only have to think about medical cannabis as part of your healthcare journey and not worrying about contaminants and, and, and all of those components. Um, but I think, you know, as long as people know um, that there's a potential that they could be contaminated and you know what those side effects are. Um, but I think it is also important, um, maybe the next time you go to purchase cannabis to look for some, you know, look for a product that actually has taken that extra step. Uh, regulations are a floor, not a ceiling. Uh, companies can go out of their way to to be better and to th and to strive for excellence. And unless consumers are demanding that, they're not going to. So you know, within the CBD um, hemp derived market that is unregulated, it doesn't mean that those companies can't go that extra mile and get certified. Um, and you know, again, if there is CBD content um, on a product or or, or, or THC. Um, it had to have been tested. You can't look at a, at a product and be like, oh, I bet that has this much THC. So if they're putting it on a product, there has to be a certificate of analysis and you have a right to see it. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for two more. If you live in a recall state and an item you purchased at a dispensary is recalled, does the store have a duty to notify you of the recall or how else would you find out <sighs> that a product had been recalled? I wish um, there the, each of the each of the recalls are a little different. Okay. Um, and um, actually, in Illinois, they have a quiet recall, which means they recall products but don't tell anybody. Um, in some states, they just issue a release and put it on their website. Um, but I don't think there's any states that require the retailer to contact patients. So. Um, uh, you can get on uh, most of the cannabis uh, regulators now have updates. You can sign up and get emails from from your market and they will, you know, that could be a place to find out about recalls. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, um, there there's still um, there's still a lot of uh, improvements to be done in that area. Um, and another reason why it'd be great to see a, a federal program. 
I would say also just to um, subscribe to your your state government Department of Health, their newsletter, because a lot of the time those announcements or recalls notices will go out through through there. Oh, that's great information as well. The last one, and we're getting many different uh, questions around this, is what research is being done on cannabinoids in different types of disease states? So, for example, migraine and headache diseases or cognitive dysfunction, um, pelvic pain, neuropathic pain. Is there a go-to place where individuals can, can come to to find out what research is being done currently? So you can oh, go to clinicaltrial.gov. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Sasha. I was just going to say, like, subscribing to one of those PubMed uh, clinicaltrials.gov, but go for it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So clinicaltrial.gov actually has a list. And, and actually, NIH um, just announced um, last week that they are, um, you know, uh, putting forward an, a bigger initiative to study cannabis and cannabinoids. Um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the research that we're seeing is observational. Um, studies because we we really haven't done the work to standardize the terminology um, to allow us to really look at at research that would result in product development. Um, and there's a whole list of reasons why that is a challenge. One is that you know pharmaceutical companies are not going to step in and do this. Um, these products are, are they start at a generic level, so they're not going to make the profits they're used to. Um, and there just currently isn't a pathway um, within the FDA or HHS to allow for um, multi um, products with uh, multiple active ingredients to make it through a clinical clinical trial model. But we can change that. But um, I would just say for research, um, you know, clinicaltrial.gov, um, we have a, a list of, of research findings. And just be careful. I would just say one one quick thing. There's a lot. There's actually more reviews about cannabis research than there is about actual research. So you'll see like someone, you know, that is not a doctor, that's not a researcher, that is reviewing the available research and making assumptions. That is not science, pseudoscience. Um, and you should really look at the, you know, that person if they have a conflict of interest or or why they're doing that review. That's great. So if I should you have say, one thing. Yes. Yeah. Just one additional <laughs> thing. So the observational research too. So that's one thing that Realm of Caring takes part in uh, that we started seven years ago at Johns Hopkins in collaboration with their cannabis science laboratory. Uh, it is important for paving the way for the clinical trial. So that way you can state the case with a retrospective study. Um, so we are currently looking at over a hundred listed healthcare conditions. And so that's what we're publishing on. So that way we can legitimize the therapy across different, di different conditions. Um, but you have to state the case for specific ailments and use cases before you can get to that clinical step. So that's also why you might not see it for very, you know, nuanced or very specific niche um, conditions or something that you might be suffering with, that just not enough people have also been suffering and looking towards cannabis for a solution. So, um, but we're getting there just like Steph says, we're all working on it. <laughs> well, thank you all so much. I, I want to end first. I know people are asking, where are we going to be finding um all of this information about all the different resources and links, we will have them shared on our November webpage so that you can easily find them um, after this webinar with the recording later on. To, um, to close out though, just a huge heartfelt thanks to our presenters today, uh, Sasha Kalchev Korn, Steph Shear, and Ellen Lennox Smith and Stu Smith. We really do appreciate you not only breaking down medical cannabis education, but also really your passion and conviction and the importance of sharing lived experiences to impact policies so that others may have the ability to access medical cannabis as medicine as well. Again, as I shared earlier, USP does not recommend or, any, or endorse any product treatment or modality, but rather we wanna share information for educational purposes to empower you with more tools and resources to discuss with your own healthcare team. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you will continue to stay engaged throughout this month as we get to know my cannabinoid.